adoration, bless his holy name. Worship him who reigns forever, the one who lives forever. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hero Mokoronde Ramakashande. Kain Ramakaronde Ramakashande Ramakotunda. Hero Mokoronde Ramakashike Ramakotunda. Hero Mokoronde Ramakashike Ramakotunda. Hero Mokoronde Ramakashike Ramakotunda. Rande ramo kuronde ramo kuronde ramo kushande Iro mo kuronde ramo kushande ramo kuchunda Rinde ramo kuronde ramo kuronde ramo kashanda Karande ramo kuronde ramo kashinde Kandu ramo kuronde ramo kuronde ramo kushende Indu ramo karande ramo kuronde ramo kuchunda Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. And the Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worshipped. Now you have prayed for Europe. It is time to pray for yourself. So you lift your voice to the Almighty God loud and clear and say, Father. If you are blessing two people here tonight, please let me be one of them. Go ahead, talk to the Almighty God. If you are blessing only two people here tonight, Lord God Almighty, let me be one of them. Let me be one of them. Oh, yes, Lord, let me be one of them. Ramo Kushande, Ramo Kurunde, Ramo Kushande, Ramo Kurunde, Ramo Kushande. Thank you, my Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know my Redeemer liveth. He liveth forevermore. I know. I know. I know, I know. Yeah, I know, I know, my Redeemer, He liveth, He liveth forever. I know, I know. I know, I know, I know, my Redeemer, He liveth. I know, my Redeemer, He liveth. He liveth forevermore. I know, I know. Oh, no more pushing, no more pushing, no more pushing. Here I'm a good, no more pushing, 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 no more pushing.
King of kings and Lord of lords, the ancient of days, the one who is the one who was, the one who is to come, the Almighty, the one whose name is wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Glory be to your holy name. Thank you for bringing us together tonight. Thank you because we know you are here. And where you are, miracles are bound to happen. Accept our worship in Jesus' name. Tonight, Father, in the lives of each and every one of us, please do something new. Save souls tonight. Yeah, Heal the sick tonight. Yeah, Set the captives free tonight. Yeah, Please, Daddy, don't let any one of us leave here empty handed. Yeah, I'm asking, Lord God Almighty, that through the power of your resurrection, everyone here tonight will go back with at least a testimony. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. And let someone shout, Hallelujah. Uh, I want you to wave to one or two people and prophesy to them and say, God, we bless you tonight. And then you may please shout another hallelujah and, and put your hands together for this wonderful choir. In uh, Luke chapter 5, from verse 1 to 7, the Bible tells us that uh, Jesus wanted to preach to the people. So he borrowed the boat of Peter. And when he got into the boat, he sat down. And the congregation stood up. So the Bible way to minister is for the preacher to sit and the congregation to stand. But by the authority vested in me by the Lord Jesus, I allow you to sit. <laughs> but I will be sitting too. Let someone shout hallelujah. I'm delighted to be with you tonight. I thank God for all those who have ministered before me. Um, I might not be here, but I was following you in my prayer room. And uh, I thank you, you've all done extremely well. Thank you very, very much. And the real reason why I'm sitting tonight is because I felt that, number one, this is the 10th anniversary of Eurocon. <laughs> number two, I don't know exactly, God knows, when next I will be able to attend your convention. Um, Coronavirus has messed up a lot of plans. Uh, there are several places in the world expecting their own convention. And so I 
decided that rather than preach tonight, we should have a Bible study. So if I'm sitting down, then we won't have to hurry. <laughs> I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't have to say, well, my leg was getting tired. <laughs> if a man says his legs are getting tired at the age of 80, you can't blame him. So I decided I will sit down. We will have a Bible study. But it will be a Bible study you won't forget. <laughs> now because there are some of us here that I definitely am sure had never attended a Eurocon before. People have never been uh, at a festival of life or Holy Ghost service before. I need to explain certain things so that we'll be able to flow together along the same wavelength. The first thing is, in a Holy Ghost service like this, when God speaks, He speaks in a certain manner, different from any regular service. He speaks to individuals, no matter how great the crowd, he focuses on individuals. So you are likely to hear as we go along, God could say there is someone here when he locates somebody who needs a particular ministration. But then at the end of the day, you may discover that someone here may end up to be a hundred people. You might think, oh, the man of God had made a mistake. No. That's the way God speaks. For example, he says, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man he has my voice. He was talking to a whole congregation. But he addresses himself to individuals. For example, I know for sure that there is someone here who will never weep again. Where is that someone? <laughs> so he might be talking to a, little, a huge crowd, but he will say, there is someone here. That's one. Number two, the Holy Spirit flows like a river. John chapter 7, from verse 37 to 39. The Bible says, on the last day of that great feast, Jesus Christ stood and cried, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the Bible explained it further to us. It was talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit flows like a river. So if the, Holy River, the river of the Holy Spirit is flowing in your direction and it is your turn to dip a bucket in the river and get out your water, if at that time you doze off, God mentioned your particular case and you hear somebody next to you say amen and you woke up. And you turn to the fellow, what did he say? Ah. <laughs> By then it will be too late. The river will have flowed on. So tell your neighbor, don't doze. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> be on the alert. Mm -hmm. The next thing you need to know about the an Holy Ghost service like this is that without any doubt at all, God is here. Ah, sir, how are you sure? Ah, he said so. He said we are two or three. I gather together in my name. I will be there. Now we are more than two or three. So without any doubt, God is here now. And I'll give you another reason why I'm sure he's here. By now, I'm sure you begin to understand why I say I will sit down. So, so we won't hurry. This is a night never to be forgotten. Yeah. When God was calling me into ministry, and uh, I was a bit scared, I wanted to know, how am I going to survive? You are calling me out of my lucrative uh, job into the assignment of a pastor in a very, very little church. And we were very rich in those days. <laughs> what assurance are you giving me? He gave me one assurance. He said, I'll give you only this. Wherever you go, I will go with you. So right now, believe it or not, right now, the headquarters of God on earth is in the Netherlands. Yeah. It's in this room now. <laughs> then, if you read the book of Exodus chapter 8, Pharaoh was facing a big problem. Frogs all over. Frogs on his bed, frogs in his uh, pot of, of soup, pot everywhere. Then he sent for Moses. Please talk to your God. Let him take these frogs away. Then I let two people go. Moses said, fine. When do you want me to talk to God? You know what Pharaoh said? He said, tomorrow. Ah, tomorrow? You want to spend another night with the frogs? <laughs> What's your own concern? I'm the one dealing with frogs. <laughs> Moses said, fine. Then till tomorrow. Keep company with the frogs. That leads me to a very important question. When do you want your miracle? Are you sure you don't want to wait till tomorrow? <laughs> Finally, Every fellow who got a miracle from God got it by faith. God is not a talkative. Bible says God has spoken once. Twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. God does not have to repeat himself at all. Let there be light. And there was light. Simple. So when God repeats himself, it is because what he's about to say is very important. So when you hear him say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he say, Hey, pay attention. 
when he speaks three times, when he repeats himself three times, it means the situation must be very serious. If you read Joshua chapter 1, read it from verse 1 to 8. Three times he said to Joshua, Be strong and be of good courage. When he said it at first, he said it gently. The second time, be strong and of good courage. And I was talking to a house help who was about to become head of state. And that fellow was trembling. By the time he said it the third time, there was a hint of anger in his voice. I said, be strong and of a good courage. Have I not commanded you? But do you know that four times God repeated himself four times. What was it he said four times? The just shall live by faith. Four times. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Romans chapter 1 verse 17. Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. The just shall live by what? How many of you believe that you will not live here without your miracle tonight? Be unto you according to your faith. All right, now I think I've prepared the ground. Tonight we want to speak on his resurrection power. The text will be Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Revelation 1, verse 18. Jesus is speaking, and he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Let's do a little bit of introduction. When we talk about his, we all know immediately we are talking about Jesus Christ. When we talk about power, I'm coming back to resurrection. And we talk about power, we talk about that which enables you to do very difficult things easily. I mean, <laughs> opening blind eyes is not an easy thing mm. even the best of eye surgeons will tell you if you are already totally blind for you to be brought back to seeing it's going to require some very special and delicate operations so if you have the power to wave your hand and blind eyes open. That's power. <laughs> if you wave your hands at handkerchiefs that people lift up and they take the handkerchiefs and go and tie it around the neck of a Muslim woman. <laughs> And she got converted. 
That's power. I tell you, you have a rough idea. The resurrection, which is a big word here, is to bring someone who had died back to life. See, Jesus said, here, yeah, I live, I died, I'm alive again. That's what resurrection means. Bringing the one who had died back to life. That power that can bring the dead back to life belongs to one person alone. To Jesus Christ. The one who himself said in John chapter 20, uh, John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26, John 11, 25 to 26, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The power belongs to the one, the only one who had conquered death. The one who took the keys from that person who had the power of death. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. And as we read in the text we read, he has the keys of hell and of death. He decides who dies and who lives. So resurrection is talking about bringing somebody from death to life. Now another definition that we want to come to our mind quickly is what is life? It will amaze you that if you ask your neighbor, what is life? He's not going to be able to tell you. Why? Ah, um, check. What is life? Uh, life is living. Ah, what is living? Well, living is life. <laughs> When we were in the elementary school, they told us that uh, somebody, something is alive if it can move. When we grow older, they tell us that uh, trees don't move, but they could be alive. Oh, there are words like that that you think you know, that you, you really don't know. And many of them, I don't want to waste your time even though we are doing a Bible study. When we have words like that, particularly in advanced mathematics, don't be afraid, I'm not going to teach maths. <laughs> we define such words by their opposites. Life is the opposite of death. Because death is easy to define. What is death? Ah, that's simple. Death is permanent separation from people, places, and things. Unlike holidays or vacation. When you go on vacation, you are separated from your people, you are separated from your house. You are separated from your bed. Temporarily. That's vacation. Death, permanent separation. From people, places, and things. So what is life? Life is the opposite of death. And therefore, 
it is reconnection to people, places, and things that you have been separated from. So resurrection, therefore, is nothing other than reconnection. So I'm going to look at this topic patiently, thoroughly, by looking at resurrection from various angles of life, physical, material, mental, spiritual, etc. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't take too long. I'm a mathematician. I can say a lot quickly. When we talk about resurrection for someone who is sick, we are saying you are healthy, sickness came, the devil came, stole your health. Resurrection means you are reconnected to your healthy form. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans 8, verse 11 says, If the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the same thing we quicken. You know the word quicken means make a life. The spirit that dwells in you will quicken your mortal bodies, bring your bodies back to normal. In Mark chapter 3, for example, Mark chapter 3, from verse 1 to 5, Mark 3, 1 to 5, Jesus came into the temple, saw someone with a withered hand, you know the meaning of widowed? It means it wasn't like that when it was born. I mean, when the fellow was born. The hand was normal. But something happened, and the hand began to shrink, became lifeless, widowed. Then the one who has the power of resurrection said to him, Stretch forth your hand. And as he was stretching for the hand, the hand became normal again. So I'm starting by using the authority vested in me to say to those of you who have any part of your body that is already disabled, receive your health again. In Mark chapter 8, to give you another example, Mark chapter 8, from verse 22 to 25, Mark 8, 22 to 25, the Bible said they brought a man to Jesus. He was blind. Jesus took him aside, spat on his face, and, and touched his eyes, and said, what can you see? The man looked up and said, I see men like trees. What does that tell you? He used to see. He has seen trees before. He saw, I saw men walking like trees. He could recognize trees when he, before he went blind. And then Jesus touched him the second time and he could now see clearly. He was seen, he became blind. The one who had the power of resurrection said, okay, see again. That's good news for those of you who have eye problems. Because before you leave here tonight, you'll be seeing clearly again. In John chapter 5, 
from verse 2 to 9. John 5, from verse 2 to 9. The Bible tells us of the pool of Bethesda. A lot of people gather together, waiting for an angel to come, stir the water, so the first fellow to jump in will be healed. The Bible said, the one who has the power of resurrection, the Lord Jesus, came visiting. And he saw a man there who had been there for 38 years. That man was not born sick. He went to that poolside because he had been, he became so sick, doctors could not help him. So he went to look for a miraculous solution. When the one who had the power to make the sick whole arrived, all he had to do is speak a word. And the man was instantly healed. I thank God for doctors. They're wonderful people. What would the world be like without them? But most of the time, they give you injections. They give you tablets, two tablets, three times a day for one week. Injection in the morning, afternoon, evening. And then you get to a stage there and they say, there's nothing more we can do. But there is someone who can heal instantly. And he's here right now. Are you ready to receive your healing? Lift your hand to him and say, I receive mine. And you get it tonight in Jesus' name. I always give the testimony of a man, very wealthy man, who for one reason or the other suddenly became paralyzed from waist downwards. And they took him from Nigeria to the best hospital in London. And he was there for months. And one day, the head surgeon came to him with a very long pain. And he said, Chief, because he was a chief back home. He said, yes, watch me. He was watching. And he drove the pain through his thigh. All the way through. He asked the chief, can you feel a pain? The chief said, no. Professor said, your legs are dead. There's nothing anybody can do for you. Go home. Stop wasting your money here. So they took him home. When he got home, there was a little girl living in the same house. He went to the old man and said, Sir, if only you can get to redemption camp. That's where I live. And my father in the Lord prays for you. You will walk again. You know how little girls can get you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so they brought the old man. He took six hefty men to carry him from the car into the house because he was a big man, heavily built. I read to him Romans 8, verse 11. He's here right now. Yes. Anyone ready for a miracle of healing? Yes. Receive it in Jesus' name. Yes. All right. Let's move to your finances. <laughs> I know that will interest some of us. <laughs> power as far as your finances are concerned we're talking about those who 
used to be rich and then became poor and then through the resurrection power become reconnected to wealth. A good example you will find in Job chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. Job 1 from verse 1 to 3. The Bible described for us Job as the wealthiest man in the whole of the East. He was so wealthy the whole continent of the East knew him as the richest. Then the devil came. And you know the Bible says in John chapter 10 verse 10. John 10 verse 10. He said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But, and thank God for but, I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He lost everything. According to Job chapter 1 from verse 6 to 21. Job 1 from verse 6 to 21. He himself said with his mouth, Now I am naked. To be naked means there's nothing left. But then, the resurrection power worked on him. And by the time you read Job chapter 42, from verse 10 to 13, Job 42 from verse 10 to 13, the Bible said he became twice as rich as he used to be. Somebody said the devil is a fool. Because if the devil knew what was coming, he would have left this man alone. <laughs> and he became reconnected to wealth for the rest of his life. Because the Bible says in Job chapter 42, from verse 16 to 17, Job 42, 16 to 17, that he lived for another 140 years. And never knew poverty again. The next prayer I'm about to pray is for those of you who know what it is to be really poor. Some of you don't need to say amen. But for those of you who want the resurrection power of God to touch your finances, it shall happen tonight. I've shared the testimony, some of you have had it before, but some of you I knew, of a man who was very wealthy. I mean, he had, I think, 14 cars. I mean, if you have 14 cars, you can't be a poor man. Then he had a quarrel with his wife. And the wife happened to be connected to the devil in a very special way. <laughs> and so the wife said to him, he said, by the time I finish with you, you will be trekking. That means you, you won't have a vehicle left. And the man laughed. What kind of joke is this? <laughs> How can a man with 14 cars ever trek? And business was going on fine. But to cut a long story short, everything began to go wrong. Until he had only one car left. And he had, so we call it, five euros left. He was hungry. The fuel in the car was running low. So he had to decide. If I spend this five euro to eat, then the fuel would dry out. I would trek, like my wife prophesied. 
if I spend these five euro on fuel, what will I eat? That was when he was compelled to come to Jesus Christ. And the resurrection power of God touched his finances. The day he was sharing his testimony, he was dedicating two mansions at the same time. I decree in the name of the one who has the power of resurrection, your finances shall come back to life. <laughs> Then let us talk about something called hope. Uh, it's a good thing to have hope. I mean, for example, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Oh, thank you, Lord. I know God loves Europe a lot. <laughs> the first word that is coming tonight is coming to someone. There's someone here. The Lord need, says, you need to fly to catch up with your colleagues. <laughs> In other words, they are so far ahead of you. Ordinary means won't get you to catch up. But the Lord asked me to tell you, don't worry, I will give you wings. In Genesis chapter 12, from verse 1 to 4, God promised Abraham, he was 75 years old, or thereabouts, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Get out of your father's house, etc. Amen. I believe God. So he got out. <laughs> but one year after another, after another, the wife didn't become pregnant, no child. Then came Genesis chapter 15, from verse 1 to 6. Genesis 15, 1 to 6. And God said, Abraham, yes, look at the stars. Can you count them? No. Ah, so shall your seed be. Amen. He still believed. He was still hoping. But years followed upon years. Uh -uh. <laughs> By the time we got to Genesis 17, from verse 1 to 18, Genesis 17, from verse 1 to 18, when God kept on saying, eh, you have many children, eh, your wife will be the mother of nations, the Bible said, he laughed until he fell on his face. <laughs> you know what he was saying? God, stop this joking. He has lost hope. Just let this smile live. I've, I've managed somehow to get another child. Forget. Thank you very much, uh, but let's stop this joking. But something happened. The one who has the power of resurrection paid him a visit. And when you read Genesis chapter 18 from verse 1 to 14, Genesis 18 from verse 1 to 14, when he entertained the Almighty God, and God asked him, where's your wife? And he said, oh, behind the tent. And God said, within the next one year, you have a child. It was Sarah that loved this time. Not Abraham. In a miraculous way, his hope was already restored. The resurrection power of God has brought this man out of absolute despair. He was ready now to believe God for anything. The Bible says it in Romans chapter 4. You can read it from verse 16 to 22. Romans 4 from verse 16 to 22. He says, Abraham against hope believed in hope 
when everything looked hopeless, he still hoped. Why? The power of resurrection has brought his hope back. Ah, uh, I will <laughs> give you an example of somebody that you can call completely a hopeless situation. It has to do with one of my daughters. And I hope somebody who is already hopeless is listening tonight because that power of resurrection is going to renew your hope. Yeah. She'd been married for years. She was barren. And then somehow someone told her, stop wasting your time. You have no womb. Automatically, if somebody says you have no womb, <laughs> That's the end. You, you can't begin to hope for your, a child when you have no womb. But she came to a meeting like this, and God spoke to me and said, There's someone there that there's no way, humanly speaking, that she could have a child. But God says she's going to have a set of twins. And she happened to be a believer. She believed. And as soon as the word of God has gone forth, you know, the Bible says he sends his word and he healed them. Uh, beloved, those of you who are in Europe, I know you are highly educated, so you reason a lot of things out. But you can't reason out God. Your brain is not good enough to do it. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm, I'm just being very polite. Pleasantly polite. I have discovered from my own little experience the best of us the most brilliant of us cannot reason out God. He works in mysterious ways. And the reason we get too, so many miracles in Africa is because we've reached a stage where we don't even bother to reason it out. If he says he's going to do it, amen. Because like I've explained to my colleagues who, you know, I used to be an academician. When you hear a man say, I have PhD in mathematics, or somebody like me, you, know, you look at him, oh, this man knows mathematics. It is deceiving you. How much of mathematics does he know? If he's among fellow mathematicians, they will ask him, you are PhD in mathematics? He said, yeah, ah, good. Uh, what aspect of mathematics? Pure or applied? And he says, applied mathematics. That's me. Okay, uh, what aspect of applied mathematics? And I say, uh, fluid mechanics. Ah, okay. What aspect of fluid mechanics? <laughs> Two-dimensional motion. Okay. What aspect of two-dimensional motion? <laughs> what particular aspect of this little bit that you say you know. And you say, well, Navier-Stokes equation. Ah. That's what he got PhD on. 
Beloved, it will take a thousand years for somebody to study the mathematics that is known. And you want to compete with God who knows all mathematics, all physics, all chemistry, all biology. This girl heard that there is someone here that humanly speak cannot have a child, but God says she's going to have a set of twins. She believed. And she became pregnant. Went to her doctor. The doctor said, I don't know what's happening, but there seems to be a child here. The guy said, no, not a child. God said, twins. <laughs> and the doctor, the very specialist man, said, if, even the fact that I see something moving here, I'm not even too sure. She came back about three months later. Ah, well, it looks as if there are two here. The day came for her to deliver. And because the husband was wealthy, so the husband said to the doctors, please, we don't want any other child. Two will be enough. But we don't want to take any risk. We don't want a case of saying why she was in labor. Something went wrong. Please operate. Just bring out the twins. And then you can seal the womb. So they put her to sleep. She woke up and everybody was looking at her as if she fell from the stars. They said, what's wrong with you? Where are my twins? They said, your twins are okay. And then what's the problem? They said, you wait for the professor. The professor came. Professor, what's the problem? The professor said, after I took out the two twins, I was searching for the womb. This is the first time in 34 years of operations that I've brought out a set of twins from somebody who has no womb. Now that's big enough. Just to let you know why people like me behave as if I'm a child in the hand of God because that's what we all are. That's almost 20 years ago. Then some months ago I got a letter from her. I've not seen her for quite a while. I mean, by the grace of God, the church has grown. Daddy, I want to bring my twins to you. Oh, good. I have not seen those beautiful ones for a long time. And then she came. Uh, and she was carrying two new twins. <laughs> now over 60 years old. There's no nothing called menstruation of any type. And the God who did it the first time decided to do it the second time. Now you tell me what science can explain that. But there is a God who is above science. There's a God who is above medicine. That God is here today. Have they told you that there's no hope for you? The power of resurrection will restore your hope. Now, let us consider something called joy. <laughs> you know, joy is different from happiness. Happiness is something that you have when something happens. Joy is something you have whether anything happens or not. <laughs> Joy is a very interesting something. Do 
when we talk about resurrection as far as joy is concerned, we're talking about someone who used to know joy, who for one reason or the other lost joy, and then the power of resurrection restored the joy. In Luke chapter 7, from verse 11 to 15, Luke 7 from verse 11 to 15, the Bible tells us about a woman who had only one son, and the one son died. Thank you, Lord. The Lord said, there's someone here. He said, those who say there's no way you can make it, we soon come and celebrate your achievement. <laughs> and so this woman was going to bury her only son. She knew joy before. She was full of joy the day she got married. She was full of joy the day the son was born. But now she had no sorrow. The husband had died. And the devil, a very bad devil, saw people with many children and went to the house of the fellow who had only one and killed that boy. As they were going to the burial ground, the woman was going deeper and deeper in sorrow. Because she knew that very soon she would return home alone. She knew that some of those who said they were sympathizing with her were already asking questions among themselves. Are you the only one in town? Why is your own problem so bad? She was deep in sorrow. But Jesus met her on the way, laid a hand on the coffin, and said to the young, first of all, he told the woman, weep not. And the woman would be wondering, what do you mean, weep not? If, if I don't weep, who should weep? But told the boy, come back. Stop causing this woman sorrow. You can imagine. I wasn't there. But when that boy got up, jumped out of the coffin and the woman instead of continuing to the graveyard began to go back home I, I know she knew joy have you lost your joy you are getting it back tonight <laughs> let me give you another example along the area of joy oh thank you daddy Daddy asked me to tell someone, and I want to say amen to this before I tell you. <laughs> because at times he says something so beautiful, and there's nothing wrong in loving yourself first before loving your neighbor. The Almighty God says there's someone here tonight. He said, I'm going to give your entire life a total overhaul. Yes, that's an overhaul for your body, an overhaul for your soul, an overhaul for your business, and your entire life. A total overhaul. Let's, let's talk about this issue of joy from another angle. Let's take David. David knew joy. I mean, he was a shepherd boy. Even as a shepherd boy, he was already singing psalms. And then when nobody would consider him for promotion, God compelled them to go and bring him out. You know the story, 1 Samuel chapter 16, from verse 1 to 13. When they were not going to present him, God said, we will not sit down until you bring this boy. So they brought him. And he was anointed king. 
He became king among his brethren. He soon became king over Judah. And then he became king over Israel. Uh, nobody needs to tell you that David was joyous the day he cut off the head of Goliath. But then he sinned. You know the story. Second Samuel chapter 11. They committed that horrible sin. They committed adultery with the wife of one of the soldiers. Uh, pretended that uh, the woman was uh, uh, pregnant, tried to make it look as if it was by husband. The husband, poor fellow, refused to go home and sleep. He made him drunk. The fellow refused to go. Ah, okay, if we won't go in, we'll get rid of you. He arranged for the husband to be killed. And then pretended to be a very good king. So he brought the woman into the house and told everybody, you see how I look after my soldiers? When <laughs> time but you, I bring in their wife so I can take care. And then God confronted him. And placed a curse on him. And he knew sorrow. I mean sorrow. He cried unto God. You can read Psalm 51 when you get at home. You can hear him crying to God, restore unto me the joy of, of thy salvation. And God heard. And God responded. The baby that he got through adultery, that one died. The next baby was Solomon. The Bible sent a prophet to go and name the boy. God has forgiven me. He knew joy again. And then he wrote Psalm 34 from verse 1 to 3. I will bless the Lord. At all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us praise his name together. There is hardly any joy like the joy of a backslider who is restored to God. If you have never backslidden, I pray you will never backslide. Amen. If you are a backslider and you are here tonight, you can reconnect with God and your joy will be revived. Amen. When I got born again, I was a little child in the Lord. I went to a meeting. Gathering of children of God. They were singing choruses, most of which I didn't know because I was new. But in order that they wouldn't know I wasn't singing, I kept on making a joyful noise. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the singing stopped as if by a command from heaven. And then one man began to prophesy. Thou saith the Lord. And he began to talk. The man who took me there, I nudged him. Uh, when did God say that? <laughs> he said, shh, keep quiet. God is talking. I said, I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> Every one of you here tonight who have never heard from God, you will begin to hear from Him. Yeah. It wasn't long after that that God began to speak to me. And He would tell me several things. When I'm going to church, He would tell me who will preach, 
what text he would use before I got to the church. It was wonderful. Then I sinned. When I joined the church, I was the most educated person in the church. And so they made me the interpreter for the founder, the big man. He would speak in our native language, I would interpret. And because I was interpreting for the big one, the other pastors left me alone. The, I, was con I was reserved for the big man. Then one day, one of the pastors, I don't know what got into him, <laughs> came to me and asked me to come and interpret for him. I was angry. I didn't show it. I thought, what's wrong with you? Don't you know I am the big interpreter? If he knew what was going on in me as I was interpreting, he would have said, please go and sit down. Let me get somebody else. <laughs> but I interpreted. I finished. As soon as we finished, as I was on my way to my car, God spoke. Okay, so you are now too big to interpret for my pastor. Oh, the Bible says God receives the proud. And from the moment he said that, he cut me off. It is better never to have heard from God than never to hear from him again. I prayed. I wept. I Oh, Lord, please, just reconnect me. And if I'm going to offend you again tomorrow, kill me today. It was at that stage that he finally began to speak again. So if you, if you see that as we go along, he's saying some things, and you are not hearing it, don't worry. <laughs> I will repeat whatever he says to you. But if you have lost your joy, there is a power that can restore that joy. And that's why I said at the beginning, and I believe very firmly, there's someone here tonight who will never weep again. Amen. If you are the one, say amen loud and clear. Amen. Now, let's now move to something else. And after that, maybe I will begin to round up. It's a Bible study, but it shouldn't be too long. <laughs> There's something called destiny. What is destiny? It's a plan that God has for your life before you were born. Jeremiah chapter 1, from verse 4 to 5. Jeremiah 1, 4 to 5. Oh, thank you, Lord. The Lord said that the fellow concerned will understand. He asked me to tell you, Pharaoh will leave your family alone. <laughs> I, I don't understand, but he said the fellow concerned. We understand. Pharaoh will leave your family alone. In Jeremiah chapter 1, <laughs> from verse 4 to 5, God said in his word concerning Jeremiah, he said, Before I form thee, I knew the why you were seeing your mother's womb. I had already set to her side for a purpose. That's what is called destiny. Nobody came into this world by accident. God has a purpose for your life. 
And according to Jeremiah 29 verse 11, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, he said, good purpose. He said, I know the thought I think towards you, thoughts of good, not of evil, that you may have an expected end. Expected end. That's where God wants you to end. And it's a good one. But occasionally, someone might derail from his or her destiny. I'll give you just one example we'll do. In Luke chapter 5, from verse 1 to 11, Luke 5, from verse 1 to 11, you know the story about Peter fishing all night, catching nothing. The Lord came into his boat. He caught so much fish. He abandoned everything and followed Jesus because Jesus told him, you will be fisher of men. That's your destiny. You are not to be looking after fish. You are to be fishing for souls. <laughs> and if you follow the story of Peter, you will see he was going steadily in that direction. When the Lord said, who do men say that I am? And they were giving all manners of names, uh, titles. And he said, okay, what about you people? He said, uh, I know you. You are the son of God. And the Lord said, oh, okay. You are living to, true to your destiny. Because this revelation is not from flesh and blood. You are hearing from God. But then came Matthew 26, from verse 69 to 75. Matthew 26, from verse 69 to 75. When he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Three times. I don't know him. No, don't get me to trouble. Never known him at all. He even cursed. But then, in deep sorrow, he went out and wept bitterly. And then the Lord rose from the dead. Resurrection came. And when he rose from the dead, he said, go and tell my disciples and Peter also. Let him know I'm alive. Let them meet me. Anyway, appear to them, etc., etc. And then he disappeared again. <laughs> Peter looked at himself and said, wait a minute. This is your affair. Fishing for me. It doesn't look as if it's going to come to pass. So he told the people around, he said, At least I know one job. I go a fishing. John chapter 21. You can read it from verse 1 to 17. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. The Lord says, There's someone here. He said, you are believing me for a bundle of joy. He said, I will give you two. Yeah. And so came John 21. Read it from verse 1 to 17. Peter said, hey, me, I go back to my fishing. But the resurrect resurrected Christ went and met him there. Because again, he fished, caught nothing, and then the Lord performed a miracle. He caught so much. And after they were eating, the Lord said, um, you denied me three times, right? Yeah. Let me give you an opportunity to confirm your love three times. Do you love me more than this? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And then he told him, Feed my lamb, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Your, your destiny is restored. Hey. 
Yeah, so shall he be. Yeah. I give you my own example to illustrate this. Way back in 1951, I was very young then. I'm still young. <laughs> I'm only 80. And I used to say, those who are younger than I are young. If you are older than I, you are old. <laughs> so those who are young, let me hear you shout hallelujah. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. I think you people told me I have plenty of time. They are telling me, no, the time is no longer that. Well, it's not my fault, too. <laughs> At least you're already blessed. Yeah. In 1951, before they drive us out, <laughs> I was a small boy, and an ab uh, a bishop from the Anglican Church came to visit our village. And we all lined up, small boys, school boys, to welcome him. And I saw him in his beautiful robe and his beautiful car. Hey, ah. When I got home, I told my mother, I said, when I grow up, I will be a bishop. <laughs> but as I grew, I forgot everything about the church. But God found me out. He saved my soul. And today, I might not be a bishop, but I'm not too far from being there. <laughs> he restored my destiny. Yeah. I know there are some people here today. Your destiny might not be where it should be. But if you come and surrender your life to Jesus Christ, He will reconnect through the power of his resurrection. Amen. So if you want to give your life to Jesus, you have to really hurry up now before they drive us out. Amen. Come and stand before us so we'll pray for your salvation. I'm going to count from one to ten. Before I say ten, you have to be here. Then we'll pray for your salvation and the almighty God will do the rest by himself. So if you want to give your life to Jesus, Come very quickly. I'm counting now. One. Two. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You have to really move fast. Three. Four. If you are coming from the overflow, you have to really, really hurry up. Five. Six. I want to prophesy that the next time we have a European convention, it will be in our own building. So nobody will be able to drive us out. Seven. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Eight. Nine. All right, keep coming, keep coming. Just make sure you get here before I finish praying. Now, those of you who are in front, talk to the Almighty God. Ask Him to have mercy on you. Ask Him to save your soul. Promise Him that from now on, you will serve Him. And the rest of us, please, let's intercede for these people for just one minute. Pray that the one who saved your soul 
will save their own souls also. And if you are still coming, you have to hurry up now. You have to really, really hurry up now. Thank you, Father. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. If you're on the way. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. <laughs> my Father, my God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your word. And I want to thank you for these people who have come to surrender their life to you. Please receive them. Amen. Forgive them. Amen. Let your blood wash away their sins. Amen. Admit them into the family of God. Amen. And give them a brand new beginning. Amen. And from now on, Anytime they cry unto you, answer them by fire. Amen. And let your resurrection power continue to work for them. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Now, I want to rejoice with those of you who have come forward tonight. And I want to promise you as a man of God that from now on, I'll be praying for you. So I will need your names, your address, and your prayer request. Uh, the counselors will be attending to you in a moment. But I want you to be part of the prayer about to pray now, so that uh, you can take that final blessing. Um, every one of us, are you ready for your miracle? Yes. Stand on your feet. You don't have much time. We we'll probably have five minutes left now. But within the five minutes, I want you to cry to the Almighty God, loud and clear, and say, Father, Father. let your resurrection power walk upon me now go ahead talk to the almighty God talk to the almighty God thank you father let your resurrection power walk on me now walk on my body walk on my life as a whole Work on my finances, restore my joy, restore my destiny. Let your resurrection power bring hope to me where there was no hope before. Let that great power that can raise the dead descend mightily upon me. Thank you, my Father. Glory be to God. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Father, in the name that's above every other name, the name at which all needs must bow, I commit all your children to your hands. Amen. When you want to perform a miracle, you do it suddenly. Within the next seconds, every miracle this your children need, give unto them. Yeah. We won't have time now, Lord, to lay hands, but you, the Almighty God, lay your hands on them. Amen. Let your resurrection power move them out of death into life. Amen. Every good thing that the devil has killed or destroyed in their lives, bring it back to life. Amen. And from this day onward, Lord, the power to serve you wholeheartedly release unto them. And let this day mark a turning point in their lives. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. And now, uh, those of you who have come forward, you can go quickly to my right. The counselors are there to attend to you. Let's give the Lord a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Now, according to my own watch, we have five minutes left, and there's something we do in every gathering like this. After the Lord has blessed us, we always say thank you to him. So within these few minutes, will you please take your thanksgiving offering, and the Almighty God will receive it from you. And while you are doing that, 
uh, you've had testimonies of handkerchiefs that have been blessed performing miracles. Even as you are taking out your offering, take your handkerchief or any piece of cloth that you want and raise it up to God. I'm going to ask the Almighty God to send power into these pieces of cloth and you'll be sharing testimonies at the miracles that will come as a result. Very quickly, raise the handkerchief to God. Oh, thank you, Father. My Father, my God, I thank you for the power you have deposited in me. And I'm using that name that's above every other name to ask you, please, saturate every piece of cloth that is lifted to you now. Amen. Saturate with your anointing. Amen. So that wherever each one is used, yokes will be destroyed. Amen. Miracles will happen. Amen. And your name will be glorified. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, as soon as you drop your offering, place that and catch it on your own head. Be the first partaker of the anointing. And just prophesy to yourself that from now on, I believe in under the resurrection power of the Almighty, I become a vessel unto honor in his hand, and I will do mighty miracles for God. And ushers, very quickly, collect their thanksgiving offering. Choir, you can sing. God bless you all. Not for what you have done.